Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and this is a presentation about how to be a better generative DevOps user. ChatGPT or large language models, what I'll call LLMs throughout this presentation, is a path to create a better DevOps experience, a better operator experience. And we're going to explore how to use generative AI to become better at doing our jobs. And we're going to include practical insights on harnessing these LLMs to serve as expert advisors instead of simply being better script generators. And this started from asking the simple question is, can ChatGPT generate DevOps scripts? This is part of an ongoing question. Actually, my whole company, RackN, we are enthusiastic users of this technology, and we've gotten a lot of experience in how to make it work better for us. And I'm going to share those with you. So ChatGPT, if I just start with the most basic and say, ChatGPT, make me a cloud, one of the first things you'll notice is it doesn't even understand what I mean in context of cloud. It's going to tell me about actual clouds. Warm air rises, it offers an experiment on creating my own clouds in a bottle. If I clarify that I meant a computer cloud, then it's going to guide me through the most basic sign up for AWS. Um, and then if I say I actually want to use Terraform, I know a little bit, it's going to create without any further prompting a Terraform file. Uh, and this is pretty normal interactions for what you'd see with ChatGPT. It's going to make a lot of assumptions about what you're asking. And the Terraform file that it produced here is very, very simple. This is exactly what it produced. Uh, and what you'll notice is it's incredibly simple. It's a very basic, uh, looks legitimate on the surface Terraform file. And if you start pulling it apart and looking at what it did, there are a ton of, ch of issues and assumptions baked into how this Terraform file is going to be used. And, and to be fair to, to ChatGPT, it actually gave me a lot of boilerplate about um, how Terraform works and things to be concerned, you know, consider and things like that. And so one of my duties would be to read all of that, that material that it gave me, not just take the Terraform file and execute it. But even if I did trust this Terraform file, just on a quick inspection, there are a ton of questions I have around this file. Even something simple as why pick US West 1, um, which is a very busy region, um, might not make sense at all, doesn't make sense for where I'm geographically located. Um, naming conventions, the AMIs or AMI, if you prefer, um, of that, you know, those are region specific. Is that right for this region? I, I don't know. Um, why is this size? They're just problematic right from the start. Looks legitimate. You could be excited. Oh, it gave me something usable. But a lot of questions arise out of even the most basic uh, generated information out of these chat GPTs. And the reason why this works like this is the LMs offer the appearance of expertise, but without knowing a lot of things. It doesn't know your policies. Are you supposed to use AWS or VMware or Google or something completely different? Which regions are you in? Which operating systems do you prefer? Do you have naming conventions you're supposed to be using? Tags that you're supposed to be adding? Required setup? All of these things are unique to your environment. It also doesn't have any inf information about actual syntax rules here. My example about a AMI alignment and knowing if you're in the right region for that alignment, it doesn't know that rule. It will produce an AMI based on what it sees on the internet without actually knowing if that's valid. And that same problem applies to allowed configurations. Does it compile? Does it actually work? Uh, it's not testing anything. It's just giving you what it thinks is the right answer. Is it well-designed code? And is it the right version, right? These models are trained on older systems and there's capabilities that are in recent versions uh, and bugs and security issues that might be in recent versions that it doesn't actually know anything about because it's not an analyzing the systems or the rules or the programming language and making its recommendation. It's doing it based on a body of knowledge and inferring the right thing to do. And most concerning to me in this is the LLM doesn't actually know anything about the operational context that you're doing. This is even beyond your policies. This is your organizational knowledge. Is this right for your infrastructure? Is this secure? Who's going to maintain that code after it writes it? 
Uh, is this the right code that we want to maintain? And what's it going to cost to actually execute this? There's no consideration for budgetary concerns. Uh, you could prompt and add some of those pieces and ask those questions. That's exactly what we're going to get be getting into. Every one of these questions here could be added into the prompting, and you have to know to do it. That's why you're here. That's why you're listening to this talk, is to get some better idea about that. And it's important to think through, this isn't just about, can I generate more automation? We had a round table with industry leaders uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, you're welcome to read it or uh, listen to it. Uh, we did a summary with Redmonk. It was uh, absolutely fantastic. And the thing that jumps out to me from that round table was we had a VP of infrastructure at a top US bank say, we already have too much automation. It's hard to maintain. They have a lot of silos. It's, it's not that we haven't automated things. The challenge that we're facing here is that we have so much automation that we don't know how to manage. So we want to see if LLMs are going to add to our existing dumpster fire by having us generate even more automation without controls and governance, or can we use it to fix the automation we have? Can we make us better at leveraging what we have in house and actually when we build automation, make more durable, reusable automation? Because ultimately that is the key distinction here, not adding more and more automation into our existing dumpster fire. And the reason we care about this, the reason my company Rack N thinks so hard about this is that we, we help companies deal with exactly this problem and we hear it over and over again. Our mission is to make better operators, to allow automation to be reusable and shared and composable so that you're not maintaining automation just for your company, but you're actually able to leverage community good automation. And we are super excited about having LLMs and AI contribute to finding and reusing automation and making the automation we have better rather than just creating new shallow automation. And what our platform does and why that's important to us is that we are an infrastructure as code automation software platform, what you might think of as a DevOps scaffolding. So instead of replacing Terraform, we connect Terraform and Ansible and Bash scripts and boot processes and things like that. Fundamentally, we are empowering operators to work better across all of these automation silos to build an integrated system. In doing that, we recognize we need to understand what's holding you back. And what we see is a surplus of equipment types, vendors, documentation, tools and tooling silos, and architecture. We have a lot of this stuff and it's okay. Our environments are complex, they are needfully complex, but we have to help operators cope with all of these different options and systems that you have to manage. Unfortunately, that's coupled with a lack of reusability and valid validation, simple linting, just knowing if scripts will work correctly, having time to work on backwards compatibility and make sure you don't break scripts in a new use case for an old use case, building more resilience in so faults can be detected and fixed, and then actually sharing state so all of these tool silos can work together into a system. And so we really have a challenging environment to work within. So how does LLM help with these challenges? As you might expect, it can help you write scripts and refactor scripts. And I'm going to show you concrete examples to help you do better with these, with these functions. You're going to be surprised as you learn to do this, that it can actually substantially improve the quality of your output if you ask it to that it can translate the format of things into languages that you're comfortable with or things that you want to consolidate. And it can write really good summaries of the work in front of it in ways that can actually help you take a QA pass. And as you get better at that, you're going to be delighted to find that it can explain things to you that are very functional, that can actually help boost your knowledge and understanding, that help you find alternatives or think of new ways of doing things and do planning operations. If you already know DevOps, this will enhance your productivity. This is like having a great mentor, an assistant, somebody you can call on to do work and review your code and give you ideas and bounce ideas off of right there all the time. This is exactly how uh, Rackend uses these types of technology and it is a remarkable productivity boost. 
It's not a substitution for you understanding things, but it definitely helps you do the work better if you ask for the help. So let's be concrete, give you some, some really simple but powerful examples of how to use LLMs effectively. The first here is the simple, I need help writing a regex, a curl command, a bash, or a PowerShell example. And in this case, I actually did this just the other day, I needed to write a test for a URL using curl, and I didn't even want to bother looking up the syntax at all. So I said, hey, test how do I test this URL using curl? And it gave me an answer. The challenge is the answer it gave me and was correct did not work for the API I was trying to test. So I had to test the results before I passed it on to somebody else as the way to, to do this. When I told ChatGPT that it didn't work, it gave me an alternate way to do it, and that way worked and was a much better use of the technology. And I was able to give that answer and embed it into our documentation for testing some of our APIs. It gave me a lot of great boilerplate text. It gave me an idea. Um, I could have certainly done this myself, but having something write the syntax for me in a meaningful way was very helpful. Um, you'll see a lot of code generator stuff you really are back to chats. There isn't a code generator for your PowerShell or your um, Bash scripts yet. There is code complete, but that's not as intelligent as what we're looking at in these types of systems. And if you were not using this, uh, you were actually spending a lot of time writing these commands, especially if it's regex or code snippets or Bash um, or PowerShell, you're spending a lot more time doing that than you need to. Uh, this is a great way to get a, a bootstrapped system. We're going to talk about ways to make this even more productive. Another thing that you can do that's really powerful is you can ask it for code review and recommendations. So you can, I asked it to look at some Terraform that I had. It gave me a ton of information about that Terraform. Now, when you look at that, a lot of its recommendations are not right. Some of them are excellent and some of them are based on an interpretation of what's in that code that is not actually complete. And so you have to look at its example as partial truths. Uh, and then what you can do is you can go and recommend those improvements um, and it will go and actually do those updates for you. Once again, some of the updates it put in were not appropriate. And so I had to go back through and check it and review it and make sure. Now, one of the tricks is to ask it to make improvements and then tell it, don't make this improvement, don't make that improvement, or be more prescriptive in how you let it do that. Effectively guiding a junior engineer through this process. Um, and that experience can be very fast. It gives you a sense of basically co-working with somebody and evaluating things. So if you're doing it right, you never accept anything it does on faith, but you do treat it as um, an intelligent coworker who can make do work really quickly and then accept your feedback or give you feedback on the work you're doing. In that sense, the ability to allow it to do refactoring is really powerful. One of the recommendations that uh, ChatGPT had made here on my Terraform was that I could convert it to modules. Um, that Terraform was not really long enough to justify doing modules, but um, when I asked it to convert it, I said, go ahead, please convert it into modules. And it did definitively do the work for me. So it gave me a really nice head start in doing the type of refactoring work that I would have had to go and do some uh, grindy toil uh, breakdown and put things into the right place and get the syntax right. Here, it did all that work for me, and that was actually really helpful. There's a huge caveat with this. Since the LLM doesn't know anything about your operating environment. It doesn't know enough to say, wait a second, there is an existing module in your library that you could be using to do this type of work. You should use that instead. And so you have to be careful that you are aware of your environment or, and we'll talk about how to do this, prompting to include a list of the modules that you have available and what they do so that it will include it in that analysis but it is absolutely essential that you never forget that these systems do not understand your environment and they could easily be recreating work where you should be using shared libraries because it doesn't know about those shared libraries. Once again, you are not off the hook on anything. One of the things that I found most surprising and exciting in, in a lot of use cases is the ability to do re-platforming. So I took this same Terraform thing and I said, you know what, I actually, 
I'm not interested in using Terraform here. Um, there's been a lot of noise right right at the moment about Terraform in general, and you might decide, you know what, I'm, I'm, Terraform is too risky for me, or our company wants to switch to a different platform um, than Pulumi, or I really don't want that abstraction. There's tons of reasons, or you're just not used to Terraform and you're more comfortable with something else and you wanna see and understand what Terraform's doing behind the scenes. In this case, I chose to convert this Terraform into Bash, it literally built all the command line instructions to do the work that Terraform was doing using AWS uh, CLI. Did a good job. I know both systems well enough to evaluate that those are, are correct. Um, I went a step further and then asked it to templatize that work. So it built a bash script that flowed information from command line, command line actually captured the output, captured the UUIDs that were returned and then built up a state file in that Terraform. So it built a really nice bash script out of all the CLI commands that I, that I had done. Even if you're like, ah, I'd rather just use Terraform, the ability to convert into the, the scripts and actually see what it would do is really powerful. You could do the same thing in opposite. You could say, oh, if somebody's giving me a whole bunch of CLI commands, could I convert those into Terraform? Could I convert them into Python? That's amazingly powerful. If you were used to using one thing, if you like Ruby more than Python, you could be converting a library easily into your comfort or into English and then reviewing it to make sure that it made sense and giving yourself a code review based on a reinterpretation of that code. The potential here is amazing, right? Not just that I could tool lock in out and convert between tools more easily and then help my company consolidate into a, a more limited number of tools, but I can actually then reinterpret things and get new impressions on how things work. Um, that can be very uh, potentially exciting. One of the things that's always worth knowing and, and people don't understand this, they don't accept it, uh, prompting and tone really matter in how these systems work. Um, you know, I, I did a fun experiment where I talked to it in cowboy, the howdy y'all, and I talked to it in French and added uh, bonjour and things like that. Just little simple ads. Uh, I actually did dude where I was rude to chat GPT and very impatient with it. And in each case, it responded to me appropriately for that persona. And, and the and matters here, and it gave me different advice depending on who I pretended to be. I asked the same question in a lot of cases with the same words, but the tone, the prompting, the framing I gave as a persona actually changed the advice it gave me. So you need to make sure that you are asking it as a persona a DevOps engineer and a Python developer, a cloud expert. Uh, and it actually helps in the models if you are polite, that that actually nudges the model into behaviors as it interacts with you that will give you a more helpful result. You're thinking, wow, this is really weird. Um, this is one of the top tier skills of learning how to work with these systems. And they are effectively experts in, in a box and you, the way you interact with them does change the results. I can't emphasize that enough. The reason why it's doing this is because they are effectively stochastic parrots. They've ingested a whole bunch of, of knowledge and your job in using them is to unlock that knowledge. So let's talk about what that looks like. Uh, the simplest one, and we've talked about this, is prompting and prompt templates, which means setting the scene and tone make a big difference in how you get results. So the pro tip here is to, I need help from a DevOps professional who understands Linux. That will actually change the results that you get. And it remembers your conversation. So if you're in a place where it's not giving you good advice, you might want to restart the whole conversation and change your, temp your prompts because it's going back to the path it took you down to get here. And if you're in the wrong place, start over. Um, what I recommend is actually keeping a pre-wired framing template where you actually might have a whole bunch of information that you drop into that chat at the start to give it information about your environment, what you're trying to accomplish, that you use Google, that you use Amazon, that you use VMware, that you prefer this distribution of Linux with this type of system. That framing will save you time and give you better results in how ChatGPT responds. That gets closer and closer to something you're gonna hear more about in the future in the industry, which is vectorization or vectorizing. 
which is actually warming up your chat with a whole bunch of existing information. Uh, VMware just announced some tools where they can scan your code base internal without going to the internet or a service provider and then use that as part of your system um, AI uh, inputs and it'll actually make recommendations based on your existing code base. That type of technology is going to be a big deal in 2024. So look for tools that you can vectorize your data as input and then use that to impact how these prompts work. Uh, that's exactly what Racken has been doing with something we call Racken GPT, where we've ingested all of our documentation and code and we are building an integrated chatbot to help operators find and use existing automation. So instead of building new automation and new scripts, there's so much in the product already. If people knew to find how to find it, they would be more productive. And that's where we're focused on improving productivity here, not writing new scripts, but actually finding the ones that already solve people's problems. That's a game changer in how you can use your systems. You probably already have automation to do most of the tasks. You just haven't been able to find it. But Watch out for sending sensitive information into the public domain. Just because you can do this doesn't mean that you should take all of your operational data and information and dump it into ChatGPT. That is not safe. So be careful where and how you are sending this information and what you're sending and sharing with these tools. Know who's going to be potentially consuming it on the other side. My recommendation is don't share things if uh, they're sensitive. And then to put a sort of a cherry on top of this Sunday, you need to improve governance. You still own the results, so you need governance. You need the checks and balances. It is a great idea, a real pro tip, to use the LLMs as your first pass. It will tell you if the work it's doing is good and safe. You can do that security audit, but don't assume the generated code is safe, it's smart, or maintainable. You need to treat it as untrusted sources where you're gonna do the review, but, you need to be careful about flooding your already overloaded human review systems. I haven't met any operators who think they have enough time to do the reviews and checks. And if you start dumping a whole bunch of computer generated code for people to review, you are gonna find your system is flooded with governance requests and everything will break down. You need to find ways to have less governance burden, which means doing more pre-work in these systems, in a lot of cases, finding smaller changes, reusing modules, um, using existing automation and tweaking existing automation reduces governance burden rather than basically creating mo many clones of the same information that then people have to check. The worst case scenario is people give up on checking and just accept this code because you can't be guaranteed that it's safe, secure, or well governed. So with that, we need to zoom back a little bit and understand exactly what's going on here. Because this isn't just about having knowledge, there's actually expertise in these tools. And it's important to understand what is expertise. I like to compare you to a Cordon Bleu chef. There isn't really a lot of difference in the food, the tools, the ovens, the kitchen, but the knowledge that chef has in how to prepare the food makes all of the difference. And what we're able to do here is actually change the game and bring knowledge into your kitchen that you need to take advantage of. Here, there's an old analogy about pizza as a service, this idea that the difference between a platform as a service, a, a function as a service, infrastructure as a service that used a pizza analogy here. And people got very tied up in this because they, they looked at the, the equipment. And I, I want you to rethink this analogy as expertise. Knowing how to make pizzas is the difference here. And doing that well is the thing that we want to have expertise on. And it's very possible that LLMs could bring expertise into your domain and put it at your fingertips, if, if you think about it this way, that changes the game on how you perform as an operator. What I really recommend you do, I talked about this, I have a whole 30 minute talk about this type of expertise and how it can change the game. So check out this video of mine. Um, I really dig into this topic and thought. So let's recap. What can LLMs fix for us? It can definitely address our surplus of documentation, tooling silos, even equipment types and vendors, but helping you with architecture is still out of range. And it can definitely help you with your lack of reusability, validation, and linting if you ask it. You can even use it to improve the backwards compatibility and resilience of the scripts you have if you start from your existing systems and ask ChatGPT to help it. It will not help you connect those systems together 
because it doesn't have enough knowledge to know how to join those systems. That is still on you. That's exactly what Racken helps to fix because that is tremendous value add into building connected maintainable systems. And this leads us back to this knowledge that we should have using these tools that operations is not just scripts. Being a faster coder or an automator is actually not the secret to being a DevOps professional. It is understanding the patterns that you're working with and your organization needs, putting things into pipelines and connecting shared state together, and then understanding the expertise in context. An example that I want to give you here is how we do at RackN composable workflows. So we chain together a sequence of events, this is our pipeline, through a process and share data across them. Within each one of those steps, what we've done to make them portable and reusable is we've standardized process components along that workflow. So the idea is that you could do, say, ChatGPT to help you with a small piece of this and not have to deal with the whole workflow. So your knowledge of the full operational context and being able to chain all those work pieces together is transformative in how you deal with operations instead of just focusing on the work that you need to do. These, the schema is important. And then we've gone further by making the pre and post process steps extensible so you have extension points. And the nice thing here is that you can do very small pieces of work inside of a larger process. And ChatGPT or any LLM is amazing in helping you build those scripts and work units and take on very small tasks as part of a much bigger spectrum. The LLM doesn't have enough information to do all of these pieces and build this pipeline, this shared state information, but it can really create a much more powerful experience for you by helping you work within these other systems and understand how to build the small units of work that make a big difference. Together, all of these ideas can help reduce sprawl if you do them well. Work on your prompting templates, vectorizing your data, and fix your governance so that you can limit the amount of garbage that you produce in your own organization and really focus on having less operational work to do, um, less operational things to manage and govern. That is the key to using LLMs effectively in your organization. I hope this has been helpful. If you have any questions, I am happy to help you uh, talk through what these ideas are, share tips and tricks about being a better user of these tools. They are amazingly productive, and I wish you good luck in using them. Thanks.